Well, uh, my name's Royce Colby. I was a technical sergeant uh, in, in the Air Force. Initially, a uh, staff sergeant, uh, but then I was elevated to technical sergeant uh, when I became a radio operator for the for the crew, a second crew. I had not been in the nose turret before on our missions. But on this mission, I was in the nose turret, and my, my responsibility was to arm the bombs and to uh, drop the bombs when the lead aircraft dropped theirs. The flight to Missburg was <clears throat> pretty much the same as all the other flights. There was the same routine, getting up in the morning, anywhere from 2 to 4 o'clock in the morning, having breakfast, going to a briefing, grabbing equipment, getting on the tarmac near the plane, and, and uh, checking out the equipment. Takeoffs are all pretty, pretty much the same unless it was bad weather. Uh, after takeoff, we usually uh, uh, formed in a, in a formation. Uh, we were the 491st Bomb Group, and among that group were four squadrons, three of which flew each day. The fourth squadron remained down. So once we get in the air, we, we form our, our three squadrons and uh, as soon as we are organized, we go across the, uh, to Europe and uh, head for our initial point, known at that time as IP. And then once you get to the IP, there was only a a certain distance and time before getting to the target. And once you get past the IP, the bombardier takes over the airplane and if you're going through a flak field, you continue to just receive the flak. You, there's no evasive uh, capability at all once the, once the uh, bombardier begin steering the plane. I saw the fighters and I accidentally somehow dropped the bombs through our bomb bay. And uh, the bombs would not, uh, with, would not go off inside the airplane because they had a vein that has to go, uh, the, the, the pins I took out of the uh, Bombs right after air, right after we took off were uh, take were to keep the veins 
on the bomb, uh, uh, was not going off. And when the bombs dropped, the veins would come off and the arms, uh, the bombs would be armed. I accidentally released the bombs. Uh, I was in the nose turret and I had a uh, device to release the bombs with. And uh, somehow I actually did that before we got to the, bomb, the, the, the target. Our aircraft was the fly, flying the low, low, uh, low, in the low position for the wing of the group. And uh, what the fighters did, they knocked out the uh, top group, all of the airplanes were uh, lost. And, uh, and our uh, squadron, uh, we lost seven airplanes out of nine that uh, uh, included ours. Pilot to Bombardier, your ship, Roger, miles away. That was probably when some of the bombs went down. I didn't know all that. All I know is that I was in a plane and we all somewhere attacked. And I was firing at a plane when I was facing this way and Taylor was over on this side and a burst came through and from high and down, whatever it is, I caught it in the shoulder. Of course, my first reaction, I said, you gotta come where I'm standing with all the room up here. And Taylor waved his arms and he went down. When he went down, he knocked out his oxygen connection of mine and the communication. So I went over there and he just going like this. And I didn't, I, I didn't see, you know, that he, where he wounded it. And I was a little, you know, concentrating on getting the oxygen max. I put the tool hooked up and then I, I realized somebody's got to shoot these guns because if they see these guns flapping in the breeze, they're going to come at you because they figured nobody's there. So I took both guns, looking this way, looking this way. But I should tell you this. We put a bomb box, a crate, in the middle. And we, because we're sitting there with a flak suit, 28 pounds. He sat on one side, I sat on the other side. Well, when we got hurt, I moved that box by me. I couldn't pick it up before, but the frantic, I figured the, the shock that I was there, I had strength to pick that thing and move it out of the way and I stood in the middle of the plane and firing a couple of shots out. I'd watch to see a German plane that would fuck off one night. He tipped his wing, my finger went squeezing. And I could get to the point where I could count the bullets that are going to come out in the same way. And this went on and then I see another plane were firing whatever it is you fired and I didn't see any really come in except one. But that was before we were shooting. And all of a sudden we're starting to go home, you know. I did not know about the Bombay doors were 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 gone. Uh, or I, or I when when we uh, P fifty ones appeared and we had a fighter escort, so we started going back. We had dropped out of that formation because we didn't have any bombs to drop, so we were off on us our own for a while, and. Us being wounded, the German picked on us a little bit. When the P-51s, they we were escorted. So the pilot said he was going to try to get the Belgium and crash land or land by the uh, Brussels airport. Our protection was flying over as long as they can to protect us, keep the bombers away or the fighters away from the bombers. And uh, this day, they. They encountered some uh, fighters coming in from one direction and so our protection went down below to fight the uh, FW-190s, I think they were. And when they did that, we were un unprotected. So our, our squadron being what they call Tail End Charlie, we were the last group in, a, in this 
formation. And it was a low group. So uh, we were attacked. The, the squadron, or the, yes, the bomb group was attacked by another 90 FW-190s that came in from 12 o'clock high. And they just riddled our whole 491st bomb group, knocking out one whole squadron, all 10 planes, knocking out seven of the 10 planes and another squadron. The squadron we were in, there were three of it, three three planes left over. Uh, our plane, which was riddled pretty badly. Our aircraft was so badly injured that they had to lose altitude to control the, uh, so the airplane could keep under control. And they had to use full left rudder because of the engines that were out. And uh, because that made the aircraft go straight. And both, both of the pilots had their foot on the left rudder all the way in. We came over the front lines about 10,000 feet and they shot up anti-aircraft at us. And we knew that we were over the front line somewhere. And then uh, at the, at the aircraft commander landing, uh, said that he could not, he didn't think he could land the airplane safely. And to get the, uh, get the, get everyone on the back out. I was talking to him on the interphone uh, all during this conversation. And uh, he said, uh, I told him that Taylor, I don't think could make it. He says, well, I can't, keep this aircraft under control well enough to land it. So uh, I, uh, I got the people in the back out. There were four of us, a tail gunner and two uh, wounded and myself. And the radio operator had to go back through the bomb bay to get his parachute. Two of our members uh, were wounded two waste gunners. One of them was Carbone, uh, who received a bullet in his shoulder that went into his chest cavity and from there into his back bone and he was in tremendous pain. Uh, so I was, uh, as the operator, I was responsible for take care, taking care of the wounded. I, took care of him first and then started to work on Taylor and uh, the bombardier came back to help out. Um, he, uh, he helped me bandage Taylor up and we put a parachute on him and have him come out of the, para uh, out of the camera hatch, not the bottom of the plane. And he did likewise with the uh, carbo. We did get back uh, to over Belgium, and uh, as it turned out, the day before or two days before, the uh, Belgians, which had been occupied by the Germans, uh, uh, were free, and the, the Germans were pushed back into Germany. We didn't know that. And I went back up to the front of the plane, to, through the bomb bays, and got my parachute and put it on. Because we'd already been ordered to, to bail out. There was no way that the plane could land near Brussels. The airport was uh, bombed. They said, you want us to help you out? I said, no, I'm fine. And I went over, sat down, tumbled out, and I found I couldn't pull my shoe. I couldn't pick my arm. It just was dead. And you know, I said one, two, I got the three. I said, what the hell are you counting for? So I picked my hand up and I put it in the ring, but I couldn't pull it. I just couldn't pull it. And now I started getting a little frantic and I started hitting it, hitting it, hitting it, hitting it. But I had to go around here and, and just about touching it, hitting it. 
And all of a sudden I said, this is not working. I better try to, I know what the parachutes are like because I had, a, I had seen them and I had a cousin that was a parachute packer and I was going to try to pull it. But before I even did that, the chute opened. I said, oh, I, said I must have had help. And then floating down, it took me 20 minutes to hit the ground. I know because I was told by the ambulance driver to pick me up. And I said, oh, I wonder if I can hear myself sing. And I try to sing a note, I can't sing, I try to whistle. I hear, but just like I'm talking now. And I sit in there and then all of a sudden I see the ground and it looks like I'm way up there. And then it starts to get closer and closer. I'm crossing my legs as I see a tree. I uncross my legs. I cross my legs. And I, but by the time I hit the ground, I was limp and I hit it with my heels. And I fell flat on a soft ground. And I bailed out from the, from the deck, and just, just behind the engineer. But I got down to the ground first because I found out later why. When we were at the flak uh, place, when we got back to England, we went to a flak house and uh, we found out that uh, my parachute had uh, been riddled with a couple bullets. And with all that folding, it was, it, there was over 600 holes through that parachute. And so my, my descent was quite fast. I, I landed pretty fast and pretty hard. My parachute opened, and I was happy, and uh, I hit the ground near the monastery, and uh, about 20 of the students came down and went dressed in white, and about 200 people gathered around, and two of the uh, uh, students could talk English. I was talking to one and the other one was translating to the crowd. There was a lot of people around me and they started running towards me. I pulled out my 45. I said, don't come near me. Because we were told that if you land in Germany, they're going to kill you because probably somebody got killed, some relatives, so keep the, don't go to the civilians. The people stopped, but in two minutes, an English voice says, you're on some friendly territory, and they picked me up, put me on an ambulance. I put the gun away. They took me to the uh, hospital, a matter of minutes I was there, they stuck me on the floor. Uh, a British officer drove up in a jeep, and he had an enlisted man with him, and he says, we're trying to round up your crew. And uh, he took us into what was then a command post, uh, the major in charge, and uh, this major, uh, we were all sitting around the table, four of us, and the major brought out a bottle of scotch and put it in the middle of the table, and he says, you guys have had a rough day today, and I says, yes, we have, and uh, we finished the bottle of scotch, the four of us. Then they had uh, fresh eggs and uh, white bread, we were, in England, we were using powdered eggs and dark bread that was not very good. The villagers that had been surrounding me when I landed uh, had donated enough eggs for us to have fresh eggs, which was a real treat for us. We had been eating powdered eggs, which turn green when they cook them, you know, and uh, so we were very happy to get those fresh eggs. It was a real treat. And we waited, I think, one day, and then they we got a C-47 back to England. But after that, the crew members all disappeared, except the pilot and I. And we apparently had stayed and, re and continued to fly the following eight missions before the, before the war ended. The rest of the crew, which had crashed a couple times already before that, and they got sent back to the States. I was able to finish my missions, I got 24 missions, and the pilot also did. 
pilot's name was Lanning, by the way. So that's, a, that's about it. I don't remember enough about the mission itself, other than the fact that we got attacked by all those FW 190s. And they were, they would come right up to the side of our plane and turn up the bottom up toward them, toward us, and you know we could shoot them, but the bullets would bounce right off the bottom of the plane. That's one thing I remembered seeing. And also, being the radio man, I had a little window to look out, out over the engines. And I saw a lot of the planes pull up and go to the, some a few up would go to the, and into a sales, tailspin and go to the ground. Some of them were blowing up right in the middle of the sky. And you might see a parachute or two come out of it, but not many. And those various squadrons, that one squadron was com completely wiped out, and I saw a good number of those planes go down. I didn't see them all. I had, a, I had made a, made a uh, connection with a young boy about uh, 10 years old. His name was Douglas. I used to call him D for Douglas. And he says, if you ever get shot down, can I have your uh, so, uh, your uh, brass? I, I used to shine my brass. They'd come over and shine it every once in a while. We'd play ball with them, uh, try to play ball with them. And uh, he, he, he came up to me and he says, I don't want your brass. And he gave me a big hug. And he said, I just want you back. That's about the end of it.